Council, February 11th, 2019. Welcome to our work session. And I'm opening the work session for the joint meeting for eWeb and starting at 5.30. Okay, I'm just going to take uh, two seconds, uh, a couple of introductions and a couple of rules. Um, I'm going to ask you to introduce yourselves because I realize the name tags actually aren't that user friendly for those of you around the table. <laughs> so just quickly, so we don't use up time, too much time, your name and eWeb or City Council Association. So we will start to my right. Uh, Betty Taylor, City Council. Uh, John Brown, eWeb, Wards 4 and 5. <laughs> Mike Clark, Council Ward 5. Mindy Schlossberg, eWeb at large. Chris Breyer, Eugene, Council Ward 8. Jennifer Yeh, Eugene Council, Ward 4. Frank Lawson, uh, eWeb General Manager. Uh, Ethan Nelson, Intergovernmental Relations Manager, City of Eugene. John Reese, City Manager in Eugene. Claire Syret, <laughs> City Council, Ward 7. Dick Helgeson, eWeb, Wards 2 and 3. Greg Evans, Betty's Bodyguard. That's <laughs> 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 really a very good job. <laughs> I'm Steve Patel, eWeb's Ward uh, 1 and 8. Emily Semple, City Council, Ward 1. Sonia Carlson, Ward 6 and 7. E and Lucy Venice, Mayor. And I'm hearing, understanding my mic is not working. Is it working? I hear you, but I can't stop the mic. Mm -hmm. Does it work? Yeah, it doesn't sound like it's working. Okay. Well, can we? Oh, we'll, we'll share. We will share. Okay. All right. So just a quick uh, plan. The plan is um, we have a staff presentation first for 20 minutes or so is my understanding. And then uh, we'll, Sonia and I will each keep a cue for our respective uh, organizations. And we'll do as we did before, uh, because there are twice as many, two city councilors and then followed by eWeb commissioner back and forth for the, and the first round. And then the second round will be one off. So. Uh, you're held to two minutes, and we'll just keep a cue. So, folks, let let us know if you want to speak. And with that, I turn it over to staff. Great, thank you. Good evening, Mayor of Venice, City Council, and the Web Commissioners. <clears throat> Again, I'm Ethan Nelson, the city's intergovernmental relations manager, and that includes oversight of the city's climate and sustainability policy efforts. Tonight, we have a great set of brief presentations scheduled for you, and ideally, plenty of time for question and answer. <clears throat> Excuse me. I will provide a short overview of the city's climate recovery ordinance and action planning efforts, followed by UWeb General Manager Frank Lawson to discuss smart electrification, and with Juan Serpa Munoz and Matt Rodriguez to discuss electric vehicle programs, uh, with a wrap up by Jason Huser on a statewide carbon cap and trade policy being worked on currently at the Capitol. <clears throat> There are four key messages that I'd like to convey. The first is Eugene is a leader in addressing the climate challenge. As you can see, the city council has continually set the tone and vision for climate action over the past decade. As we saw in the climate journey, council adopted the climate recovery ordinance referred to as the CRO in 2014 and updated it in 2016. Eugene is one of the first communities in the world to adopt a science-based greenhouse gas emissions reduction goal. These two goals on the screen are the two primary drivers for updating the community-wide climate action plan. The second key message is Eugene has a track record that shows community commitment to environmental stewardship. As many have heard me say in the past, Eugene's clean energy economy stems from legacy decisions and public investments over the past century, starting with the development of a publicly owned water and electric utility and the opportunities that came from that community decision. That community commitment has extended through investments in public transit, clean energy and energy conservation, multimodal transportation options, and a strong natural foods economy, to name a few. This commitment shows as we rank low on our per capita sector-based emissions comparative to other U.S. cities, which you can see there on the uh, left of the screen. My apology for your handouts, and the next two slides should be flipped in order. Um, but the, commitment, the community commitment extends to our current efforts at updating our climate action plan to create a Eugene Climate Collaborative that is designed to be a platform for continued systematic understanding of policy and investments across our community. 
Two key actors in this collective impact model are our two agencies, and you can see a number of the other agencies that are involved in our Eugene Climate Collaborative. <clears throat> the third key message is, we are in a time of opportunity to take large action to meet the adopted goals. In our climate planning, EWEB and the city have the opportunity to positively impact the two main sector-based buckets of emissions, those from buildings and transportation. As you can see, in addition to the projected reduction actions by the Eugene Climate Collaborative members, over the next 10 years, we have a gap of roughly 450,000 metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent to meet the CRO goals. And on the left is, is our uh, 2017 emissions, what a business as usual, the BAU, would incorporate, uh, what our 2030 forecast is, and then those uh, emissions reductions from the various uh, uh, climate, uh, Eugene Climate Collaborative partners. And then the gap all the way on the uh, far right. The fourth takeaway is the populations most impacted by the effects of the changing climate are those populations that are the least able to adapt to these conditions. It is the reason why the city has developed a climate equity plan panel to provide input and the reason why EWEB has incorporated equity considerations into your climate policies. The plans and investments we all take need to not only address the future conditions for our community, but also address the inequities which many in the community currently experience. Lastly, we are forging ahead with our climate action planning efforts with a focus towards this summer to wrap up the work and move towards programming at the household and individual level. There would be an opportunity for more questions later on, and at this, I'll turn it on over to Frank for a smart electrification discussion. Okay. Councilors, commissioners, good evening. Is my work, mic working? Everybody? Okay. So good evening. There's a few things that I wanted to run through this evening having to do with the electric sector and, and how we approach issues um, such as decarbonization. Um, I'll walk through some of those complexities and some of the impacts so that we can get to a point where uh, Juan and Jason can talk about some of the specifics that we're pursuing as an organization. There are a number of areas that we have to look at uh, across the economy relative to decarbonizing. Um, these are sometimes referred to as the four pillars of decarbonization. Historically, EWEB has worked in uh, very specifically in a couple of those areas. Uh, one is around the, the resource decisions that we make uh, relative to the source of electricity, um, low carbon electricity specifically in this case. Over the next couple of years, we are going to be working on our integrated resource plan, which will set policy for the next uh, round of decisions relative to resources. The other one on the left has to do with the ongoing work, and in fact, EWEB's been historically a leader in both energy conservation as well as energy efficiency. We are looking at expanding this into a couple of, of other areas, including electrification, as well as looking at our own operations. A number of studies have been uh, pursued recently relative to the impact of decarbonizing on the electric sector in, sp in specific. Um, some of these were done by an organization called E3. Um, over the last year or so, we have looked at economy-wide. One of those will actually be reported because it was part of some work that they did for Northwest Natural, uh, looking at a multi-sector uh, impact of what's called the Pathways Study in the Northwest. The other, were, the other two were specific to the electric sector. One looked at the cost of decarbonizing and the other looked at the reliability associated with decarbonizing. And we'll talk about those uh, in more detail as we go along. There were a few common conclusions out of all of these studies. Um, the first was that we think that it is technically possible to reach the 80% below 1990 levels in the electric sector. We think it's also relatively practical to get there, and so we have the technology and we have the ability, and I think that's, that's good news as far as our particular sector. We also recognize that probably the best approach to get in there is some type of an economy-wide carbon policy. Um, it is more technology neutral as opposed to picking a winning technology such as an extension of the RPS 
or saying it's all about solar, it's all about wind. This, this is more about an economy-wide approach. Um, all of the studies required some kind of deep decarbonizing of the transportation sector. Um, it's critical that we look at that sector if we want to uh, decarbonize the entire economy, and all those studies led to that same conclusion. And then finally, we, we realized that both for cost and for reliability, we ultimately need a mix of energy sources. And I don't necessarily mean the technology itself, but a mix of the profile. Um, Mother Nature will dispatch certain types of resources differently than others, and so we eventually need a mix. And to get to that 80% level, we need much deeper uh, work in energy efficiency and conservation. Uh, we also need to expand our renewables and also look at some kind of dispatchable fuel, which is used from time to time for reliability. Presently, the most cost-effective source for that is natural gas. A couple of key points about electricity. It is a regional issue. Um, in fact, 30% of the electricity consumed in the state of Oregon comes from coal. Um, it's a little bit hard to understand that because we only have one coal plant. But when you look at the total consumption, a lot of that comes from Montana and Wyoming and Utah. And so we have to really look at this issue as a regional one. As a, as, and this is actually a list of, of all the various generating resources throughout the West. Um, and this is a very integrated grid, and so all the electrons mix together. There's no such thing as a green electron or a yellow electron or black electron. They all do eventually mix. The other one is that time of use does matter relative to the carbon content. Uh, and so one of the things that you can see is that we are a winter peaking utility, as is most utilities in the Northwest. So December, January, and February, uh, we require the most energy, and then certain times of the day we require the most energy. Um, that energy at peak is the most carbon intense. Um, even when you look out into some of the future, when we decarbonize down to that 80% below 1990 levels, the difference between peak and off-peak from a carbon intensity perspective is significant. It's a number of factors. It's not percentages at that point. The other thing that I wanted to point out is there's a difference between peak and average. This is something that utilities make investments based on peak. And so the best analogy that I heard on that was you cannot fly through the mountains at average altitude. Um, we, we recognize that we make investments both in infrastructure and in resource uh, based on what we need when we need it. If you look at the build out required to meet the 80% reduction by 1990 levels, and you look at 2050, what you're gonna see is our peak in the Northwest at that time is gonna be around 52 gigawatts. So those of you who watched Back to the Future when they talked about gigawatts, well, this is, this is gigawatts at this point. Um, to meet that peak, we need to procure resources totaling 118 gigawatts. And so it's a combination of a number of things. Wind and solar play a significant role in that, as does hydro. We are blessed in the Northwest to have access to a federal resource of the Columbia River, which is both a great storage mechanism as well as a carbon-free resource. Um, and then also there is a role for natural gas in this equation as well. But what I will point out is there's a difference between peak and average. When you average out how these resources are actually run over the course of a year, you'll see that natural gas, for example, while it has the capacity to run at 24 gigawatts, the average over the course of a year is only four. And so while we build to peak, how we operate those depends on what's needed and when. Uh, we're building out a lot of renewables. Uh, however, we recognize that renewables are dispatched by Mother Nature. And so on years where there's low hydro, no wind, and not a lot of sun, we need to have the capability to meet those peaks under all of those circumstances, even though we might not run all these resources at exactly the same time. We'll run them when they're most economically feasible to run. That's why gas only runs 16% of the time in this model. Finally, I'll kind of lead you through eventually what we start to look at when we, when we mean smart electrification. It's based on characteristics. So we look for opportunities to look across the entire life cycle and the benefits. 
Uh, we recognize that there's fugitive emissions, there's efficiency of transfer that you have to look at. You have to look at um, things such as conversion of energy, there's losses in transmission. You have to look at the benefits across the entire cycle. Uh, we also, as we mentioned earlier, there's issues and differences between whether we're building on our peak or not. And so we look and say smart electrification will probably not automatically add to the peak. Uh, one of the ways to mitigate that is what we call demand response, which are mechanisms to get the consumption to move around when it's most beneficial. Demand response is going to be essential to integrating renewable resources into the entire mix. Finally, we recognize uh, there's a couple things. A TBL statement recognizes that these opportunities have to be available across our entire customer base, but also we have to take affordability into account. If we want people to electrify, we need to make sure we're not pricing ourselves out of the market and out of those decisions. So there is a balance here with cost. And then finally, there's a, a recognition that Customer choice is important here. Uh, we rec recognize that consumer preference plays a role in a lot of these decisions. And so when we look at what becomes the most smart, uh, things that jump to the surface, conservation and energy efficiency needs a lot more investment and a lot further uh, focus, no matter what the energy resource is. So whether you're talking about gas, electricity, automobiles, um, energy efficiency and conservation is, is a really critical piece to that. Um, transportation in this is one of the areas that we look at, and Juan will talk about this more in a second. That's one that's really, really important for, for society to electrify further. Um, and then the demand response. Industrial and water heating will tend to be case by case. You'll have to look at efficiency transfers. We see the most challenging one up here to be just a, a raw conversion from natural gas to electricity. It's different if you're talking about efficiency measures along with that, but to just fuel switch from one to the other um, is, a, is not, it's a marginal uh, carbon benefit. It will cause us to have significant investment in our system. It'll be harder to integrate from a renewables perspective. And so when you look at the regionalization, the time of use, and the fact that it starts to also impinge upon customer choice, I think it's one that we look at and say it might not be smart electrification, it might be less smart electrification uh, in that particular area at this point in time. So, so with that, I'll pass it off to uh, Matt and Juan to talk specifically about electric vehicles and electrification of transportation. Uh, good evening, commissioners and council. My name is Juan Serpa Munoz, and I'm the business line manager on the electrification side for Eugene Water and Electric Board. I'm going to talk to you about eWeb transportation and electrification efforts. Uh, the first slide is looking at trends, and we can see that exponential forecast in 2025 taking place. And taking a look at a more regional level, uh, we can see that in eWeb service territory in 2016, we had 321 electric vehicles. That number jumped in 2017 to 403. And in the first six months of 2018, and again, this is only the first six months, we went to 744. In Q2, we will have uh, the rest of the numbers for 2018. Looking at one of our programs that we have for electric vehicles, which is the Clean Ride Rebate, we see that in 2017, we had 14 participants. and 2018, we had 77. That's quite a jump. But as we look at January 2019, and just that month, we had 24. So clearly, the adoption is coming to this area as well as on the national level. This is supported also by commitments from the industry, uh, including General Motors, which is offering 20 electric vehicle models by 2023 but also other investments such as from the VW settlement that is providing support and funding for the infrastructure for electric vehicles on the char charging infrastructure for electric vehicles nationally, but also to Oregon. So why electric vehicles? Um, about 39% of greenhouse gases in Oregon come from the transportation sector. So it makes it a critical component of any carbon reduction strategy. 
There's also health benefits through the reduction of an exhaust emissions. And this addresses the equity piece because a lot of vulnerable communities tend to live around highways and freeways. Cost savings, about 75% reduction from fuel costs and less maintenance. And this brings a point for us to main, continue to be competitive on our pricing to continue to offer that value to our customers. The next point, flexibility of charging. This is one of the key benefits about electric vehicles, that we're able to shift that load to move it to when clean power is available. And that is a critical component of smart electrification, which is the point that the presentation of Frank was speaking on. So it brings a triple bottom line benefit to our community, sectors, and industries. Our current programs and efforts that we have include incentives, loans, and education. For example, the Eugene, the Rabab Eugene, excuse me, the Rabab Eugene partnership that we have with the University of Oregon and the city of Eugene. And that's an educational program where we provide workshops to attendees and those who attend also qualify for additional incentives from EWEB when buying or leasing an electric vehicle and also from dealerships that participate in this program. I mentioned partnerships because uh, this is really a team effort and we are part of a coalition, an electrification coalition where we work with other utilities and entities in the region to move forward these efforts on electrification, including transportation. On the new programs and efforts that we're looking at is has to do with charging. Because we electric vehicles have the ability to shift that load, we wanna emphasize having equipment that allows the customers to make the choice and find it easy to shift that load to when clean power is available. Electric vehicles uh, continue to be, uh, it's challenging to have certain technologies reach all the customer sectors. And when we look at our programs, we try to not only make them available, but also accessible. And so with electric vehicles and trying to have them reach limited income communities, we are looking at a pilot call, uh, at the car sharing pilot program where we're gonna work with limited income housing agencies and also entities like Envoy to bring car sharing to these communities. The question was asked, what if we had 25,000, 50,000 or 75,000 vehicles, uh, electric vehicles, excuse me, by 2020, 2030? On the energy side, it's not that much of an impact. It would be about a 10% and we can pre procure that energy easily. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. So looking at that graph on the energy side, it would be about a 10% increase. Uh, so that is manageable and we can procure that energy. The consideration of the challenge really comes on peak. So say for example, everybody decides to come at home at five or six and they decide to charge at that time. So you can see the peak almost being greater than twice as much. And that's when clean power would no longer be available. And that would be the challenge for us, not only as to when we're charging, but also where. Because depending where this is taking place within our territory, we may not have that capacity. So we're looking at having to invest in the electric system. With the right strategies and programs, we can address that and shift that peak to take place on during times when clean power is available. And it's easy for the customer to be able to do this with the controls already embedded in electric vehicles. And so electric vehicles makes it a, a, a very com important component of smart electrification. And this is something, again, with the right strategies that the eWeb can handle and time is on our side. So we're able to create programs and address this, look at what is coming and maximize the benefits of electric vehicles while addressing the challenges that can come in. And this is again a team effort. So we work with power planning and our transmission and distribution teams also to make sure that we have a solution that works for the utility and for our customers. Impacting EWIP, but also not having a negative, negative excuse me, impact on the region. And Lastly, thank you. This is a little slide from uh, the far side on uh, uh, early experience in transportation. I especially like the, the data guy collecting the information. <laughs> thank you very much. So good evening, council and commissioners. I'm Matt Rodriguez. I'm the city engineer for the city of Eugene. And I have a concise update on where we are with developing an electric vehicle strategy for the city. As you saw in attachment E of the council packet, 
Um, we're in process of developing the strategy, but getting close to having something for you to review. Uh, we've contracted with Lane Council of Governments to perform a research uh, project into policy and strategies to bolster adoption of electric vehicles. We also had them do a series of interviews with key stakeholders across the state, University of Oregon, El Rapa, um, state of Oregon, you know, different folks that, and, and eWeb being a major one that we're working with. And I've also had quite a few um, conversations with Juan recently, and as you can tell from his presentation, he is a real resource in our area for how to move forward in electrification of vehicles. We expect to have an update as part of the uh, Community Climate Action Plan, uh, frequent updates that you get before council break that we can talk more about at a future work session. Good evening, Mayor, uh, Councilors, Commissioners. I'm Jason Huser with EWEB, and this evening I'll be giving you an update on the status of legislation in Salem that would cap and re reduce greenhouse gas emissions to meet an 80% reduction by 2050. Uh, I'll save that slide for a second. The first thing I want to tell you is uh, in Salem, this is not a drill. Uh, there's been a cap and trade or carbon tax uh, bill proposed as far back as the 2001 legislative session. Uh, not a single bill in the past has even made it out of committee. This year is going to be very different, I believe. Um, primarily, uh, this legislation is a heavy lift, but you've got buy-in from the highest levels of leadership in Salem. I've never seen this level of buy-in and alignment between the governor, the speaker of the house, the Senate president, supermajorities, Democratic supermajorities in both the House and Senate that have identified this as a key priority for them. And then finally, not least of all, the people of Oregon. Um, I've, I've been really impressed at the level of citizen involvement on this legislation. There was a rally last week. There's a lot of familiar faces here in the room tonight that I saw in the Capitol last week. So um, that's absolutely having a big impact as well. I wanted to give you a quick snapshot of exist, existing policies in the state of Oregon to reduce carbon. Um, we've got some things to hang our hat, hat on in Oregon. We've done a lot to deploy clean energy, to promote energy efficiency. We have some things to be proud of, but as you can see, you know, we're hardly making a dent as far as creating that downward uh, trajectory to the 80% by 2050 target. So an additional policy is required. And as we evaluate how we get from where we are today to get to 2050, uh, it's clear that cap and trade is the front runner at this point in Salem. Cap and trade is both very complicated, but also rather elementary at the same time. These are some of the more elementary concepts in cap and trade. Uh, cap and trade is sometimes described as being akin to uh, creating a carbon diet or a carbon budget for the state of Oregon. Uh, deciding how much carbon we can afford to emit and still meet our 80% uh, target by 2050. There are allowances uh, that are issued in a cap and trade program. An allowance is essentially a permit to emit one ton of carbon into the atmosphere in a given year. The amount of allowances in the program decline over time, um, resulting in declining emissions. Anyone who has a compliance obligation can respond in three ways to the program. They can um, purchase allowances in an auction. They can trade for them in a secondary market. They may receive free allowances from the state of Oregon in some instances as a cost mitigation tool. And finally, they can decide they don't need an allowance at all and they can just reduce their uh, carbon emissions. There's a couple of reasons why eWeb thinks carbon pricing in a cap and trade bill is the best approach as a policy. Uh, number one, it's the least cost approach. Uh, Frank addressed that in a few slides already. Uh, it's clear that a market approach uh, is very good at picking out efficiencies to get to the least cost uh, carbon abatement strategies. It's also technology neutral. Uh, as a utility that's uh, heavily reliant on hydropower, that's very important to us, and I have a slide uh, coming up on that. Thirdly, we're a consumer-owned utility. We have five elected commissioners elected by the public. 
Local decision making is very, very important to us. One of the things we like about the program is unlike some other strategies, the state's not dictating in any way what compliance uh, uh, options or what emission strategies EWEB would employ. Those decisions remain in the hands of the elected board. That's important to us. And having worked at the city of Eugene many years ago, I know uh, local control is equally important to you. Uh, finally, uh, regional linkage is an important component of cap-and-trade legislation. If Oregon can link to other uh, cap-and-trade programs in the region, for example, our neighbor to the south of us, California, has a program in place already. There are cap-and-trade proposals in Washington State under consideration. If those programs can link together, we could end up with a, a consistent carbon price throughout the West. That would be important to help reduce economic leakage, which is important. We don't want to simply have a policy that chases jobs or emissions across state borders with no actual um, net uh, carbon reduction. So having a consistent carbon price in the region could be very uh, instrumental uh, in uh, reducing economic leakage. And finally, you know, Oregon is doing this um, to address a global problem. Uh, we're leading relatively from the bottom up uh, if we decide to go forward with this as a state. Now, Oregon's emissions are pretty small on a global scale, so that's not going to be sufficient. The idea is if enough you know, states can lead, we can link together and create a momentum that would lead to a national program and then to a global program. And uh, you know, Oregon's emissions are very small, uh, but Oregon can do its share and make a difference. And just like I vote in elections, not because my vote alone makes a difference, it makes a difference along with you know, millions of other voters, it's the same idea. Oregon can do its share and hopefully prompt uh, action in the future at the national and global uh, level. I, I won't spend a lot of time on this slide because um, Frank alluded to this already. This is a slide from the E3 uh, low carbon uh, analysis. And uh, as you can see here, uh, there's a really big difference in the cost effectiveness of carbon pricing, which here you can see it moving from uh, west to east. It, one, carbon pricing gets you to an 80% reduction, does so with existing technology, and you get twice the emission reductions at half the cost of an alternative strategy like a renewable portfolio standard. So if we're going to get to 80%, by 2050, in, in the reduction and still have a very healthy Oregon economy, it, it, it's pretty clear from this slide we want to use direct carbon pricing. And I want to clarify, you know, this is not an indictment of renewable energy at all. We need more renewable energy than we have today if we're going to get to that 80% target. And in the carbon pricing scenario, there's going to be a lot of renewable energy built in the Northwest. Uh, in order to get to that 80% that reduction. We're simply saying as a policy instrument, uh, the renewable portfolio standard um, isn't effective to get us to the finish line. Probably a good policy at its inception in 2007 to change the trajectory somewhat, uh, but to get to the finish line and do so with a healthy economy and the least cost, um, we've got to use direct carbon pricing. Uh, real quickly, I just wanted to include this slide uh, to illustrate why we care about carbon neutral uh, solutions. Uh, the Bonneville Power Administration has done some analysis on how different policies um, assign value to hydropower, and it's pretty clear to us that carbon neutral solutions um, are, are good for a utility that relies on a resource like hydropower. You know, hydropower isn't really facing a level playing field relative to other energy sources. Hydropower doesn't receive any kind of uh, incentive or subsidy that I can think of, and most other forms of energy do. So it's been a, a little bit of an unlevel playing field. We like the fact that uh, in a, a technology neutral approach like cap and trade, the only criteria that's being used is the carbon content of, of a energy source. Things like technology, fuel, age, the, the size uh, of an energy resource, none of that matters. Uh, and when you have that level playing field, um, hydropower fares very well. So that's something we like about carbon pricing. So I'll wrap it up by pointing out there's kind of three large areas uh, that I think the legislature is still wrestling with in the design of the bill. Uh, the first one, revenue recycling. Revenue recycling is basically the idea that uh, this program is going to re uh, collect revenue from Oregon's uh, businesses, 
uh, ratepayers, citizens, consumers. Uh, we want to ensure that that money is returned back to those folks to help them pay for carbon emission reduction measures. If you don't have revenue recycling, you effectively double the cost of the program. So revenue recycling is very important to um, help people keep pay the cost of reducing their carbon, or in the cases that they can't, uh, mitigating uh, cost increases, for example, to vulnerable Oregonians that are already struggling to pay energy bills or generally stay afloat in our current economy. Uh, revenue recycling will be somewhat challenging in the transportation sector. Uh, we have some requirements in the Oregon Constitution about how those funds can be spent if they're collected from fuel suppliers. Uh, so you may, uh, if, if you read the bill, it's about a 90-page bill, so uh, make a, a big hot cup of tea before you do that. Uh, it doesn't have a lot of detail in the transportation sector. Um, that's probably because they're leaving a placeholder open to address a lot of the design for transportation in rulemaking because there are some unknowns on the Oregon Constitution. And if we find out later, after the bill's been passed, we can't do things a certain way in Oregon, um, they'll want to have the ability to go back in rulemaking and make adjustments. Uh, I already talked about regional linkage, so I won't say a lot about it other than uh, we're trying to make sure we stick the landing with California. Uh, I think Oregon's checked a few high-level boxes um, that are necessary to link to California, so we're just in some details now. Um, and uh, finally, <clears throat> I think there is this last question over how much do we want to see uh, delegated to rulemaking in the bill or actually spelled out in the legislation. I've talked to a number of folks in California that have said uh, it's probably going to make sense to handle quite a few things in rulemaking. You want to have a high-level outline that gives a lot of different industries and different stakeholder groups some certainty about uh, what compliance will be like for them in the legislation, but there are just details that are so complex, you really need a year to a year and a half to iron them out properly. Um, so I believe uh, uh, the, the legislation today does have that high level outline. There'll be a little more tinkering, but there's gonna be a lot of work left to do in the rulemaking process. And I can wrap it up there and take any questions if they're necessary. All right, thank you all very much, and uh, really uh, appreciate the expertise that Iwe brings to the table as the city council is grappling with how to realize our goals in our climate uh, recovery ordinance. So uh, appreciate this partnership, and um, I feel inspired by some of the things I just heard. So I'm taking a cue. Are there counselors who wish to ask questions or speak to what they've heard yet? If not, I'm going to let the... Oh, there we go. Mike, take it away. I tried to let everybody... Let's go first on that one. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. I have just a couple of questions. Number one, um, a lot of this stuff, the initial baseline pieces of the discussion here are about the two most... Uh, the, the two buckets of highest use in consumption and transportation, it occurs to me that those are, are uh, per capita based sorts of measurements. And even with our CRO discussions previously, I'm surprised that I, it didn't occur to me to ask this question, but f from which source do we derive our population forecasts when we create these models? Councilor Clark. Um, so if I understand correctly, your, the population estimates are going to come from um, PSU population forecasts, is my understanding. The same ones we used with land use issues planning? Correct. Okay, awesome. Number, that's number one. Number two, uh, if the state does pass cap and trade, how much of Eugene's CRO goals will be no longer necessary to be met? In other words, how far will that effort get us to our climate goals and thus change our plans? Can anybody answer that question? Councilor Clark, uh, in regard to, I think at our last update, there was a slide on the uh, GAPS strategies, and in that it was estimated that the a statewide, economy-wide uh, cap and trade would could have, you know, estimates and the assumptions go within them, roughly 
I think a range of uh, around 400,000 metric tons of reduction. Uh, and that would apply then to our uh, Isn't that the size holes. of the gap? The, the size of the sector-based gap is about 450,000 tons per year. And so it would, be, it would come pretty close to addressing some of that sector-wide. But the question is, and I'd have to go back to our, our consultants, is whether that 400,000 tons is a sector-based or consumption-based. I'd really like to know how far along that gets us and whether any other strategies are necessary after they pass that. Thank you. Uh, Emily. Thank you. These are our two basic questions that I'm a little embarrassed to ask, but maybe other people don't know. Can you explain fairly simply cap and trade and carbon pricing? Uh, I'd be happy to answer that. I, I apologize if I use them somewhat interchangeably. Uh, carbon pricing is simply the idea that uh, we address an economic externality, which is right now anyone can emit uh, carbon into the atmosphere and there's no cost, um, even though we know there's some environmental costs. So <laughs> it's the idea that uh, this economic externality would now um, have a price on it, uh, would no longer be an externality. And there's, there's really two primary variants of carbon pricing. Um, they both accomplish kind of the same goal of putting that price on carbon, a carbon tax and a cap and trade. They essentially do the same thing, uh, put that price on carbon. Can you give more of an example? So like when you talk about externality, I'm not sure what you mean by that. So can you give an example of what that actually means? Sure. Uh, right now there, there's, there's zero cost to use the atmosphere and emit carbon um, into the air shed for, um, there's no cost whatsoever. So uh, in the example of cap and trade, uh, it's a policy that's capping emissions. It's not setting the price. The market will set the price, but one way or the other, there will, there will be a price in cap and trade. Um, in California, so far, I believe the, uh, the price has been around $15 uh, per ton. Um, other states have picked a price certainty mechanism, like British Columbia, they have a carbon tax. So they don't have certainty on how many tons of carbon they'll emit, uh, but they have certainly on the price. I, I believe they started out at uh, $15 and it increased over time. I think they're up to $20 per ton today. Um, so those would be two variants of, of carbon pricing. And I'm sorry if I use them interchangeably. Um, cap and trade and, and carbon tax are both forms of carbon pricing. So basically the more uh, pollution you make, you have to pay kind of a fine for it. That's a, a tax or something. Is there a certain amount you can emit without paying anything? Or do you pay for every little speck? I, yes, I'm, I apologize. I glossed over uh, uh, the threshold in the state of Oregon. Uh, the Oregon policy primarily targets large emitters, those that emit over 25,000 tons annually. So the list of covered entities in the policy, um, I believe it's less than 100 entities that would be covered, largely um, uh, utilities, uh, transportation fuel suppliers, uh, some large manufacturing um, uh, facilities, and landfills. So they're not targeting small businesses. Uh, your favorite local Eugene brewery will not face any direct carbon pricing, um, although uh, you know, businesses and consumers may feel indirect impacts as uh, some of those covered entities ultimately pass some of the carbon costs down uh, downstream in the economy. So if you're rich enough or you can charge enough money, you can keep on emitting all this carbon. And the hope is that by it costing more, you'll stop emitting so much carbon. Well, in a cap and trade, um, that, that is true. The, the program does not stop any individual person from emitting carbon. Um, if any entity seeks to acquire the carbon allowance, which is a permit to emit that one ton of carbon, they may do so. Um, I think the, the effectiveness of the program comes from that ca the, the, the amount of allowances issued each year will decline over time. So it is a hard cap. So no matter what any individual person might do, um, as a state, emissions would reduce over time because the amount of permits uh, circulated annually would decline over time. It is a hard cap and would provide certainty 
that the state of Oregon would meet specified emission reduction goals. So how would you decide who got to use more carbon if you had a hard cap? Councillor Semple, what I would uh, in think about it is that um, in, the, in our bucket slide in regards to transportation and buildings, and so if we think about buildings, um, there's gonna be power that's gonna be coming from, or energy source that's gonna come from Northwest Natural or EWIP in our service territory at least. Those two will be, those two entities would then be regulated under a cap and trade, and they would set allowances and set targets as to what level of carbon would be emitted. And therefore there would be like a, and therefore there would be a price on that. And so that would be then transferred to the consumer and ideally then either this, the energy source would become more cleaner over time or and or uh, that uh, price will then be transferred to the individual consumer and that would then be a price signal for uh, changing from one source to another. And similarly with transportation fuels in the transportation bucket, those will be economy wide and they would trickle on down to each individual consumer. And the money from the tax would, I think you already told me, but where is it going? So the, the, the funds, and as Jason had explained, is the funds from that would be going on into a statewide distribution. And one of the great things about the, the bill and in, in, in previous uh, gener uh, iterations of it has really been a focus on getting that money back into what's called impacted communities. And that impacted communities would be really targeted towards equity communities. So. Thank you very much. Commissioner Brown. Well, well, thank you very much for the presentation. A couple quick questions, if I may, um, about your, uh, your EV strategy update. Um, and it says two of the things that are there about 50% EVs by 2030 and autonomous vehicles. I'm pretty sure everybody around this table has heard about 5G recently. And we've been hearing testimony that one of the major reasons 5G is being installed is for to accommodate autonomous vehicles. Can you tell me how uh, that plays into your plan? Is that your goal is to allow that technology to accommodate uh, autonomous vehicles, or at, it, where is that in your um, discussion? I'm, I'm talking about the cities. I'm, I'm looking at attachment E. It's the city's policy. Uh, so I, I wouldn't say that um, adoption of, of 5G is a, a goal to prepare for automated vehicles right now. Due to FCC rulings, we are basically required to allow 5G technology to be put into our right of way. Um, we also are limited in the amount of money that we can charge. The uh, telecommunication companies that are putting this infrastructure in our right of way. So the FCC ruling really uh, has tied the city's hands um, in a large part in how we regulate that. And there is uh, there are lawsuits pending on that. Um, as far as a strategy for EVs, we, we have a um, contract with the University of Oregon Urbanism Next group to look at how um, autonomous vehicles might change the way the transportation system works to try and understand where we go from here. I will say talking with the uh, State Office of Innovation and their advisor on AV and EV technology as well as um, major auto manufacturers, there is a sense that this is not uh, an AV, massive AV adoption is not as near term as everyone talks about that really major automakers are not talking about any of that technology rolling out until 2022 or 2023 at the earliest. And that really we're talking about a transition of 20 to 30 years to get to all AVs on the road if that future really comes to pass. So what we're tr really trying to figure out are, are what is the kind of range of future options? How do we prepare for them? And how do we use our policy to get the, the future that the city of Eugene wants, a, a livable community with more options uh, and more accessibility for people traveling. And thank you. And my second question is about the, the change of the fuel source to the building inventory. Uh, recently, we went from a very inefficient steam system downtown to a more efficient, but mostly natural gas. And so a lot of these buildings downtown have brand new systems that have 40 to 50 year lives. And I'm wondering with that coupled with the University of Oregon being the largest 
section of buildings that heats by natural gas. What are your plans or how the economics of converting um, those buildings to, uh, to this alternative source, non-carbon? Commissioner Brown, uh, I, in, in one of the strategies in our, what's called our gap strategy memo, we looked at and we continue to look at what would be um, a, a accelerated uh, um, program to electrify, and as Frank's talked about this, this, this smart electrification, and so I think what we're trying to understand is like where do we work in collaboration to identify the um, most cost effective, uh, uh, and, and in the case for downtown uh, um, buildings that were retrofitted uh, when the steam uh, uh, resource was, was uh, decommissioned. Those are going to have a useful life of 20, 30 years. And so I think from a, from the standpoint of, of trying to do it in an effective and efficient uh, manner, those would probably not be on the, on the top of the table, especially since most of them uh, were high efficiency, um, new systems were put on in. So I think that's how our modeling's been, is that anything that gets um, electrified is really at the end of life, end of useful life of that equipment that's been installed. Thank you very much. Councilor Syrett. Thank you. Well, I don't have any questions. I just had a few comments. I really appreciate the presentations. Um, and I all very much appreciated the update on the cap and trade um, legislation uh, and kind of that high level overview. Uh, I think it's also maybe being referred to as cap and invest uh, because of what you referenced around you know, taking uh, any of that tax and putting it back into communities that are, are seeing the greatest impact from climate change and are the least able to respond to it on their own without some uh, assistance. So I really want to appreciate just in the way, I know these were staff presentations, but I'm assuming they are reflecting uh, the, the board's policies uh, that I, from, from this small glimpse, you know, I see eWeb is really viewing the work around addressing climate change as a fundamental piece of your work as you look out into the future and what our community is going to need in terms of providing energy. So that is very encouraging and I really appreciate it. And I also want to appreciate the social equity aspect of the work and really want to encourage you on the piloting program to bring electric vehicles to underserved communities. Um, I think that's, you know, when I think about all those benefits up there and then I think about the cost of a new electric vehicle, you know, it's fairly prohibitive, I'm sure, for, for many folks in our community. So we do need to look at how we can expand access to that future technology sooner rather than later. So those are my comments. Thank you very much. Councilor Evans. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I want to drill down a little bit further into the kind of the equity benefit that you're talking about. Um, what specific examples of an equity benefit would you cite as coming from a result from a cap and trade or a carbon pricing model? What Exactly what would that look like for a consumer who's on the lower end of the scale, are we talking about a reduction in their in the cost of their their um, uh, energy bill, or are we talking about other specific kinds of programs, like um, you know insulation, other kinds of things that um, uh, may be of a benefit to a customer at that lower end of the scale? There might be better people at eWeb uh, to answer that question, Councilor, but I'll take a crack at it. Um, off the top of my head, uh, you know, there, there are some um, segments of the housing market, um, like or rentals, uh, that are very difficult to access. Uh, there's the split incentive issue that the uh, person who owns the property isn't the person paying the bill. Um, one solution could be carbon revenue could be used, you know, as grant funds to overcome the split incentive issue. Uh, in the in the scenario of the that type of housing stock that's very difficult to deploy energy efficiency in, and we know there's a number of low income Oregonians that, that do live in rentals, so that's that's the type of market that's been very tough to crack to deploy energy efficiency. Um, I'm not the best person at eWeb to tackle that one, but I gave it a shot. So, uh, Councilor, I would say so, that so the it's like it's, it's like 
a benefit to the property owner, but not necessarily a benefit to the a direct benefit to the it, consumer. No, we don't work because the, the consumer pays the bill. The the home the the property owner doesn't pay the bill, and that's that's a that's what we call what we call it the split incentive problem. Um, if there's an improvement to the property, the the person paying the bill and the property owner are different people. But in this instance, the resident would still see a reduced bill in that example. And, and Councillor Evans, just the the bill as written will be amended ultimately before it it. it passes or doesn't pass. It, but as it's written, one of the targeted uh, statements is really around impacted communities. And so that's, uh, and in the definitions within the bill, that includes communities of color, low-income populations, low-income uh, communities, and organizations that serve those communities. And so what I would kind of, as I read through it and was thinking through, how would this be implemented? And once again, you got to wait till it gets implemented or um, passed and then the rules written and everything else. But that there would be funds that would, that would be directed from the tax you know, or the fee revenue that would come into the state, and then the state would redirect those on out to agencies like uh, St. Vincent de Paul that provide services, um, uh, employment services for low income and uh, b uh, individuals, and also kind of people coming back into the work, uh, into the job market, and and also uh, utilities or other organizations that are providing weatherization services, and be able to drop that cost to make it more cost effective. And also, as uh, Councillor Syred had talked about, uh, EVs. And so there's right now EVs are a great option, but you got to be able to afford an EV. And so really trying to put that money back on into investments in those quote unquote impacted communities. Uh, Commissioner Mattel. Uh, thank you, and, and uh, I want to thank staff on, for both from both the uh, city and eWeb uh, for organizing. It's a really great opportunity to get together with everybody uh, on this important topic. So, um, I just wanted to get clear on uh, on a couple things if I have the time to do so. Uh, we at eWeb staff and uh, and commissioners alike have spent some time studying the your CRO and your goals, and have thought through what our contributions to it can be, and I think we've distilled those down to about five things, and Frank largely covered them already. I'll just re-mention them very um, quickly. There's this, an efficiency component, conservation and efficiency, and we're making significant investments in um, in the residential and commercial sectors, low income, high income, everybody really, um, to help folks become that much more efficient, and there's obvious um, emissions advantages there. We talked about, or Frank talked about the, um, uh, the smart electrification, and we see that primarily as an opportunity to switch folks from those who can afford it and are interested and uh, for, whom it, uh, for whose lifestyles it fits um, to switch from internal combustion engines to electric vehicles. So that's the second thing. There's the price um, of electricity, and our goal is to keep it low and affordable so that people continue to choose it as opposed to the alternatives, which would be, let's say, natural gas to heat their homes. Um, Frank mentioned the peak management issue, um, and he showed us that uh, the when we are operating at peak at five o'clock or six o'clock in the afternoon, on a you know on a winter day, the carbon intensity of that electricity goes up by something like nine times because at that point in the day, all the natural gas um, uh, power plants around the region have to fire up um, in in order to meet the demand. So the carbon intensity goes up dramatically, we're trying to figure out ways to reduce that peak, get people to do the activities that they're doing in their homes at different times of the day so that all that natural gas doesn't have to fire up. Um, and we have a couple other, the last one is just a, the long-term commitment to low carbon power. We will have to um, uh, rewrite, review all of the contracts that we have with, with Bonneville Power, with a bunch of uh, other folks between now and the next 10 years. And so our goal is to continue those as, to the best that we can at a, at a reasonable price. That's what we can do. The point that I, the thing I wanted to, um, so we're clear about that. Some of those things would um, would be assisted greatly if we had um, support from the city. And those are the things I think that we are not yet clear about. We understand what your goals are. I don't think we yet understand um, what commitments you're willing to make um, to see those things through. So it would be great to hear about those. Great, thank you. Uh, Chris. Thank you. Um, uh, it's a good question, actually. Um, I wanted to kind of uh, get some clarification on um, the potential for our um, climate recovery ordinance and our efforts that we're doing around climate recovery and the potential for this cap and trade legislation and how those two might be able to uh, work together. And, and I think what I'm hearing is that we have goals that we've set and we need to be articulate about them and what the strategies are to get there. 
But what I'm hearing, what I think I'm hearing is, is if this legislation were to be in place, we wouldn't go, oh, great, here's a cool way to kind of just, you know, not have to do all this uncomfortable stuff. We'll just buy a whole bunch of allowances and call it good. Um, I, I, don't, I don't believe that's what I'm hearing because, one, the, the allowances decline over time, so you're not going to really wind up in the long run helping yourself. And two, um, I think we, we're being sincere about our climate recovery goals and the steps we want to take to get there. So uh, what I think I'm hearing is that if we were to invest in um, cap-and-trade allowances, it would be as a gap-filling measure temporarily to buy us time to continue on, or am I kind of misunderstanding what we're talking about? Uh, Councilor Pryor, uh, there's, there's two items, and, and I'll try to hopefully be clear in a very uh, um, complex situation. In regards to the cap and trade bill, it would impact the climate recovery goals substantially it would, for community-wide because it would be moving our economy statewide and all of the things that are outside of just Eugene's activity and also in Eugene. It would be moving us in the correct, in the right direction. In regards to then what uh, the city of Eugene would be um, uh, required to report and have allowances for, we would not be, our organization, as Jason had said, uh, the, 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 the um, limit is around 25,000 tons, metric tons per year. Uh, Eugene as an entity, the city of Eugene, we emit roughly 16,000 tons per year. So we would not be a regulated entity. And then nor would we as the city be required to um, uh, kind of uh, purchase allowances within the economy. And there's a difference between allowances and offsets. Um, the, the way that I would think about it <laughs> is, is in regard to the way the uh, Councilor uh, Zelenka says a silver bullet or a silver buckshot. <laughs> it's not, the, the cap and trade is not a silver bullet in regards to the way that um, meeting our, our climate recovery goals, those that have been established by Council. Uh, it would be one of the number and it would be a very substantial uh, action, but it would not fulfill all of the things that would then get us to those council adopted goals. I guess what I was trying to, what I was looking for explicitly was for us to say, we're not going to try to weasel out of trying to accomplish our climate recovery goals by using some external mechanism to just kind of buy our way out of it. We're still committed to doing those. And so cap and trade as an, as an economic tool is a good one, but we're not using it as some excuse to not continue to pursue our climate goals. Yeah, that, that would be a council directive, I would say. <laughs> Councilor Taylor. Uh, thank you. An answer to the question, what's the city willing to do? What, I wonder, what can we do? And or should we make everyone s get up at midnight and do their laundry and, and their showers? Or, <laughs> and it's like it's a bad thing, right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it's a bad thing or not. I just wonder, I mean, how can we change people's lives so that they use the utilities at a time when they're more plentiful. And um, also, if we, well, the big things I hear from constituents right now that they're concerned about, and while we have you here, I'd like to hear something about some reaction. They're very concerned about natural gas. And can, if everyone changed, well, if we restricted the future spread of natural gas, could eWeb satisfy the demand for electricity? My next question. Then I want to know more about 5G and whether I think I heard you say, some one of you say that eWeb has no power over that. The city doesn't have any power, but the people are really frightened of 5G. And what's what about that? What what can we do? Is it really spreading everywhere? I just got an email saying it's across from uh, Roosevelt School now, and people think it's dangerous. Is it dangerous? Can anyone do anything about it? All those questions. So, well, I'll, I'll address a couple of things. Um, I think the first question had to do with natural gas and the integration of it. Um, Northwest Natural presently is our peaking resource in Eugene. Um, if we were to attempt to integrate that into the electric system, uh, we would essentially double our peak. 
um, they supply that amount of energy. Um, that's That would be very expensive for us. Um, I also think that you would have to start looking at the entire conversion of efficiencies and other things. Um, we have deemed that not to be our first priority relative to some of the other things that we would like to do around transportation. It would be very difficult to incorporate that peak. Five G. <laughs> so a little more about 5G. So um, as I mentioned, there was an FCC ruling that went into effect in January. And basically that ruling uh, gives us very few levers by which to regulate our right of way when uh, telecommunication companies come and say, we'd like to put 5G up on one of your light poles or your traffic signal poles. The ruling basically says that we cannot um, basically deny access to the companies. We can come up with a few things like aesthetic standards safety standards, which we have, to determine where the locations are, but we can't basically set standards in a way that would prohibit the network being put in. We also are limited to, I think it's about $270 per year per an installation to charge. So basically we've lost control of, of pricing, um, you know, the right of way. So saying, you know, here's a fair market value for being on this poll. We're not allowed to do that unless we can uh, basically prove actual costs. So we are going through an exercise to make sure that with that price that we are not losing money during the process because it is actually fairly involved. We make them do a structural analysis of any poll they're going to be put on. They have to do an RF study that they give to us to verify that they're meeting FCC rules. One thing that I'll say is, uh, and I understand this is for installations of uh, on private property as well as public, we're not actually able to use, as long as they meet the RF study requirements at the uh, radio frequency, I'm sorry, radio frequency study uh, requirements that the FCC has, we're not allowed to basically regulate on top of that as to whether it's safe or not. If they meet those standards, they meet the standards and the city is not able to have a say in whether that is safe or not. So uh, as to how many have gone in, I'm actually not sure right now that's something we could get back to you on how many have been installed. Well, I know people think they're all over the place and people think they're dangerous. Is this similar then to cell towers, which we couldn't, we can't consider the medic, whether there is a medical effect? That, that's correct. Mm -hmm. um, one thing is that they do have much lower radio frequency emissions, so they're much lower power than a large monopole is. The um, As it's been presented to us, the theory behind 5G installations is having, uh, you know, basically a number of of low power installations in areas where they're trying to bring bandwidth up. So the areas that they would typically be targeting would be downtown areas towards the University of Oregon where there's higher data usage on mobile phones and it allows to get that, that data carrying capacity up. So the first question I asked was, what did you want the city to do when you, when you asked Steve Vitale, asked what's the city willing to do? What is it you would like us to do? And I think I'm out of time, but you can answer that question. Can I answer? Sure. Well, at the end of the day, of course, it's up to the city to review its options um, and, and make a decision about what those options are. I think the first thing is to get clear about what the options are. There are things you can do within the land use code, <clears throat> within the construction code that are available to you that would have um, mostly long-term, but some short-term and medium-term effects on, on people's habits. I don't think you can or it would be very beneficial for you to try and legislate when people do their laundry, but we can send a price signal to folks and we're investigating that option that, that credits them for doing their laundry at a certain time of day versus others. So that's probably the better way to handle that thing. Um, the more important thing is to figure out how we can work together. We're, like I said, we're, we're our, one of our most difficult um, challenges is to um, reach out to the low income um, folks who in the low income housing sector and uh, um, get them to sort of understand the options that we're trying to make available to them in terms of, uh, of efficiency gains and conservation work that they can do within their within their within their homes um, there's ways that the city and um, and eweb can partner on that thank you okay 
Commissioner Schlossberg. Um, so first of all, I want to thank everybody for this work session tonight. I'm actually really excited that we're all together talking about this. Um, I think that the city and eWeb all have things that we're doing um, to address climate change, and um, it'd be really great to figure out more ways where we can um, have value add by all doing it together so it adds up to something more. Um, when I, I have two questions about cons reducing consumption. So one is to kind of piggyback on what Steve just said and around housing. So eWeb offers incentives to upgrade um, uh, your heating systems or to, to make energy conservation investments, but we can't force people to do it. And we know that in the rental sector that there's a lot of rundown properties that really could use a push in that direction. So I'm wondering how do we partner with the city so that the city either updates the rental housing code and eWeb continues to offer incentives or what are the mechanisms to do that? Because I think that together we could really tackle that issue in addition to providing economic benefits for lower income folks who have high um, energy burden. So that's the first thing. And the second thing is about transportation. So I know that um, sometimes we wanna rely on technology to be a panacea for all of our problems and um, electric vehicles seem like one of those things where it's really gonna reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. Um, but I'm guessing that the overall strategy isn't just to put more electric cars on the road, but to look at transportation as a whole and also to reduce car usage by using other modes of transportation. So I would just love in future talks if perhaps maybe LTD could be part of this too because I think that they play a part in this solution as well. Um, and also with the housing because if we, I know you're, you're um, working on building more affordable housing and if we can do that along transit lines as well, that kind of reduces the need for more vehicles. I don't have any counselors in the queue so um, I, I, you have a second round, but I was going to let the commissioners no. maybe. Oh, my, Alan. Okay, go for it. Go ahead. Oh, let me go. Um, very much appreciate the uh, the work that you guys have done put together this presentation. I was actually watching it uh, through the modern uh, efficiencies that we have and the technology. I was actually watching the webcast as I was stuck on I five coming down here. So I heard the presentation on my phone. Um, so I appreciate Web's position on all this. I appreciate their position on the, and the board's position on the cap and trade bill and where you are and all of the stuff that you're trying to do here. Um, I guess a little, one thing that I would add is, is context for this conversation, especially um, when we, I always go back to the greenhouse gas inventory pie chart and look at it and say, <laughs> where are most of our emissions coming from? That's where we should spend our time. And when you go back and you do that, you look, you see that the transportation sector is where you get most of your emissions. And so it does make a lot of sense to think about how we would electrify that and decarbonize the transportation system and, and, uh, and work on that in, in a very forthright way, and especially as we get more uh, technology, this stuff will be easier and more effective to do. We've been working on appliance controls for <laughs> ever since I started in the electric industry 30, 40 years, 30 years ago. And uh, so we wouldn't, we would, we would, appliances are getting smarter too. So they can now have uh, little chips in them to can say, when should I turn on? And, and talk to the utility and say, when's the cheapest time to, to run the washing machine? And same with car uh, EV charging stations. So um, uh, one, I'll do one little update on the information that was presented. The, uh, as of the end of 26, 2018, we had 22,200 uh, electric vehicles in the state of Oregon. That was 3,000 increase last year, 6,000 this year. So we're on the bottom of that hockey stick that goes like this and then starts to go like that. We've got the incentives and we're on our way up to that 50,000 uh, goal that the governor has for EVs in the state of Oregon. All right, Commissioner Helgeson. Well, I too appreciate the opportunity tonight to be hearing a lot of uh, good information and uh, things for I think both of our bodies to consider. 
um, we, like you, are on the front end of our consideration of these things and um, trying to sort of think through and fine tune the way we approach those four or five key strategies that we can engage as a utility that also contribute to uh, to the community's uh, efforts to, to reduce carbon emissions. Um, I'm particularly interested in um, the notion of smart electrification. It sounds like there are a number of things in that, like you know, where we can utilize the renewable energy that we have available certain times of the day and not add to our peak, that sounds smart. Um, I think another attribute of that for me is that, you know, I, I recall long ago, uh, and there was a reference made here to ceiling cable heat, I think earlier when I was having dinner, um, there were times when we were heavily promoting electrification in a, in a bygone era that, that caused us to, to need ultimately, or to at least profess to need, to build nuclear plants. And uh, so I want to be mindful as we consider um, how to ramp up certain um, beneficial uses of electricity that we don't find ourselves in the long run sort of compromised by that with um, high resource costs or um, uh, things that... that um, become a problem for us in the long run. And that's why I think it's important, as uh, uh, Mr. Lawson said, to consider the life cycle costs of this. Uh, I think there's another aspect that I don't, I don't want you to take as reticence on my part to look for uh, how, how to best achieve our role and contribution to what you're trying to accomplish. But I just would want to remind us all that as eWeb is chartered, we, we have to be able to connect whatever we're doing to a utility purpose. We can't simply just be out there paying incentives to buy carbon. That's that's not going to fly in terms of our charter in the community. So that's why it's important for us to look for ways to partner with you. And I, again, would, would cite um, work in the rental sector as, as perhaps a place that we could rekindle conversations about energy codes. I know in the, in the uh, mid-'80s, um, we had on the books some energy codes that had been passed by the council when we were first in the process of ramping up our conservation programs. Uh, that anticipated the need to lead in with some code provisions to help reinforce um, those investments in the community. As it turned out, we were successful enough with that program, and they were well enough funded by Bonneville and by eWeb um, that we made quite a bit of headway. Now we're kind of at the tail end, particularly in the residential sector, where we're, we're do really dealing with kind of the tough nuts, the, the ones that after 30 years have not, um, still not converted, even though our incentives have at times been doubled for that sector. So um, if you can help us figure out ways to reach that group, particularly um, with cooperation from the landlords, that would be uh, helpful. I have Councilor Clark waiting for a second cue, but I want to make sure everyone's got a first chance who hasn't had a first chance. So do we have other? We all get, I guess, all right. Okay, Councilor Clark. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor. Just two quick questions. Number one, Frank, I think it was you that was, that was mentioning that if we were to, I'm not suggesting we will, I'm not, but if we were to radically um, uh, limit or, or stop using natural gas in our community, that it would, did I just hear you say it might double the peak draw for electricity? Yeah, if, if you look at the amount of therms delivered um, by Northwest Natural in our service territory and recognize that it really happens um, coincidental to our heating peak already. Um, the conversion of that energy to electricity would, uh, in essence, more than double. Um, if in that process there's some efficiency improvements, it would, in essence, uh, approximately double our peak load. So in order to deliver that peak load, what would be the generation capacity, or what would be the generation source? It depends on when you're talking. Um, uh, I would say if it's if it's in today's environment, we would go out to the market and we would buy that on market, which would be what would be considered a Northwest or West Coast mix. That mix is about 26 times more carbon intense than what we have in Eugene on average. So the market would be a West Coast market. <laughs> If you look at out into the future, so you look I, at- Forgive me years. for jumping. I, just, I was looking to make a specific point. Yeah. What percentage of that mix is natural gas? It is probably about 20 to 30%. So in a, in, in what percentage would be coal? 
about 30 percent. So at least more than half. If we if we stop using natural gas in Eugene, then we'd be burning a lot more natural gas and coal in order to get the electricity on peak during peak times. In today's environment, yes. Okay. Um, the second piece is this. I, I think that what we're seeing is exactly what Alan's talking about, that we're going to see a much larger demand for electric vehicles at a, at a hockey stick kind of angle. I absolutely agree. Um, and so m my question is similar is, won't we, if everybody comes home and, and plugs those in at 5 o'clock and 6 o'clock when they get home, um, we're going to have a significantly higher peak demand at that time. So, what will be the what will be the cost uh, of electricity or something? What will be the effect of the the cap and trade legislation's cost for that electricity being used during that peak time? So, there's a couple of unique differences between electrifying a north, northwest gas load versus uh, electrification of vehicles. The biggest one there is that with vehicles, you get a, a certain distribution that isn't all perfectly aligned with your peak. So, there's some distribution. And we also have the ability through a number of incentives to move that around. Um, in Juan's presentation, the whole key to that is to be able to move that to times when you can align it with more renewable energy. So. Electric vehicles and spacing is a much different application, even though if you just did nothing and let it flow all at peak, they would both have similar, similar issues. Um, as far as cost, we generally would make investments in the infrastructure based on that peak. In Eugene, a lot of our infrastructure was built in the 60s and 70s, back when, you know, back to the future, because that's when we were talking about electrification of homes, um, baseboard heat, other sort of inefficient versions. In some parts of Eugene, that means we have a lot of capacity. In other parts, it doesn't mean we have capacity. So it's almost a case by case, region by region kind of issue if we were to make an investment. Um, and so, well, I don't want to say it depends a lot of though there's a lot of moving pieces to this and so the cost would and the, both the carbon content would align with that. You know? And you'd have to pass along the cost to the rate payer of the cap and trade costs that you would have the what did you call it begins with an A I forgive me the allowance costs um, for some of those generation gener uh, some of that power generated by coal and by gas is that correct? It's, it's a little bit of an interest. Again, I think if it simply occurs at peak and we had to go to market, we would go to market at a higher price because of cap and trade. Um, the balance to that is that because we get a lot of, of uh, our power from Bonneville, and Bonneville is a net exporter of already clean energy, there could be a favorable impact on Bonneville rates while we have an unfavorable impact on peak. So how we balance that out is Really the key when you look at what eWeb is going to have to do in the next 10 years, and I would call it the synchronizing of supply and demand. It's not a static situation anymore. Well done. Thank you. I'd, I'd like to just add on to that really briefly is that one of the considerations regarding peak, and, and this is a very important part for eWeb, is, is the, um, you know, being able to have that as part of the discussion. What I would also consider is that peak is only one part of our carbon uh, uh, inventory in our equation. And so what you have to do is you have to amortize that over the in entire year and be able to look at if there are reductions in natural gas use at the at the household level over the course of time, how does that compare to then when we have to peak and then buy, mar and buy um, um, natural gas or incorporate those GHGs on a, on a uh, on kind of a market-based system? So I, I would, I would want to take a look at like what the entire bucket is rather than just what those peaking loads are because over the course of a year, those peaking loads could be amortized, as I said, and, and, be, and you'd have to actually see a net reduction across for our inventory, which that, ultimately is what, it's not what I was we've been identified as. Okay. That's, that's part of the reason that while it sounds counterintuitive, uh, we, we do need to add a, a significant number of renewables. We're, we're talking about in the region, just gigawatts of wind, gigawatts of solar. We have to make many more investments in conservation energy efficiency. Those, those are all really important to us. 
What's a little bit counterintuitive is that we have to add some natural gas in order to be able to integrate those renewables in an affordable way. Otherwise, we get so out of line from a cost perspective that this, this process of electrification just won't happen from a consumer perspective. Thank you. I'd like to jump in the, the queue here. Uh, so at eWeb, we have a strategic plan that we've been aligning our values and our work towards, and uh, the tenets of that are safe, reliable, responsible, and community focused. And for us, it, it's been really key to help us figure out when we are deciding on various um, plans of action, does it align with this? And for the, the carbon conversation, um, you know, for me, looking at safe and reliable or intertwined, we have to have reliable power that we serve our community with and make sure that we are, I mean, people need electricity to survive. It gets cold outside, it gets hot outside. You need it to be able to communicate and, and get through. Uh, responsible, we have to be responsible with our community's uh, funding and, and with their dollars that we spend. And so looking at options that reduce carbon um, and and do it at the lowest cost, regardless of where that carbon may be coming th from, is absolutely key. And that's part of why the cap and trade sort of program really gets at that. I know there's some conversation about well, you know, the biggest emitters can just keep emitting. Well, really, it's it's not the biggest emitters are the ones with the, the most money. It's it's looking, that program looks at how much it takes to, uh, if you have a very high cost to reduce, whether or not you're a low or high uh, revenue sort of company, it may be more cost effective for you to buy a credit and keep emitting and let somebody else who has a lower cost to reduce let them do that. And overall, you know, for the entire community, I mean, we're all in this together. And what this means is looking at all of it together and saying, okay, this is how we can best reduce emissions and have the lowest cost. And so for me, responsible and then being community focused and looking at ways that we can have a better outcome that is more efficient and more neutral is absolutely key. So I really appreciate this conversation tonight. And I also want to put in my last little bug again for the efficiency of uh, rental properties, because we don't have control over, uh, or even the housing stock in general, the efficiency of the housing stock. We have to serve that load, but we don't have the ability to impact when it's uh, put in place. And that's absolutely key in the building permit process. So when, when buildings are built, that life of that house may be around for 100 years, and after it's set, it's very difficult to change. So, thank you. Okay, I have two, maybe three counselors wanting us another round uh, with three minutes, four counselors. So, uh, I'm going to give it to Counselor Ye because she hasn't had a first round, and then hopefully this conversation will continue. Go thank you. I want to clarify something Mike was asking. The way I understood Mike's question was that if we stopped using natural gas all at once, how that would affect. Is that how you viewed his question? I want to make sure I, you, the answer you gave was the question I thought. <laughs> I, I think the way I interpret his, interpreted his question was if um, specific to home heating or space heating, if natural gas went away for some reason, how much of that and how would we incorporate that on the electric sector? So my question is, um, I don't think we've ever spoken on council about doing that, but we have, there has been some suggestion that what if, what if we stop creating more infrastructure? What if we kind of left our natural gas usage as it is today? Um, I, and over time, I understand you guys are trying to use more renewables. So how would that uh, that decision or that policy affect? Yeah, I think one of the things that we haven't, uh, I think this is one of those situations where the more we learn, the more questions we have. Um, when we look at these studies and we look at electrification, for example, the studies I mentioned were really very conservative relative to uh, growth in the electric sector. We're talking less than a percent and included a little bit of electrification. If we start to look at further electrification and we look at this from a regional level, what impacts do those have? And uh, we start to get into a number of new questions around um, the trade-offs of technology and every one of them, including hydro, uh, hydro has people who want to breach dams because of fish reasons. Um, we have impacts of climate change that will potentially reduce the value and the availability of hydro in our system. So it opens up a whole new question. Um, I would say that um, 
because of the way that housing stock works, it's a long-term decision. And I don't know specifically how we would incorporate that load going forward. We have pretty modest projections at this point relative to growth, and we would we would just have to do an analysis on it. It's it's a tough one to to, and it also comes at peak, um, and so if we can mitigate mitigate peaks, that's why we're looking at some of the electrification of vehicles, for example. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Mattel. Thanks. So um, I just wanted to follow up on. Um, I, I think an issue that uh, Councillor Clark brought up first, which is the anticipation of passage of the cap and trade bill at the state level and how that might affect what the city of Eugene um, pursues going forward. You're in the process of updating your climate action plan to a 2.0. Um, I think it was started a year ago before we had the, the relative certainty that we now have that that bill will pass and in a couple of months we'll, we'll know for certain. Um, in my view, it it, um, it opens up a really important and serious question. Well, there will be significant, that the state is gonna establish a goal and a mechanism to reduce um, emissions. And so we can count on some of that happening, including here in Eugene. And But what, what would be useful is to understand which of your goals will, how much of your goal will have been met via the state mechanism and where should you retarget, if, if at all, um, but where should you retarget your efforts going forward? What won't be accomplished by the state that you might want to see accomplished and what mechanisms do you have available at your disposal to meet them? Those are the questions I'd like to see answered. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close this out because we are at time and I just want to, I thank Thank everyone for this conversation, and I think just to take Frank Lawson's word, I would hope that going future, going forward, we're looking at synchronization, that we actually are thinking about how our City of Eugene policies and EWEB's policies and strategies uh, work together also with other partners, LTD and Northwest Natural, and uh, we're looking for a law, uh, uh, the bigger picture, and I'm hoping this is the first of many conversations and, um, and, and the first of, you know, of future joint joint meetings with us. So thank you all very much. And with that, I adjourn the council meeting. And I adjourn the web meeting. And we can